for tuning in. Thanks for your continued support. I really appreciate it. Let's jump right into a couple questions this morning. I am keyed up and ready to go. Okay, our friend Milwaukee Matson says, Howdy Clifton, I've really dug what you've posted so far and I'm really looking forward for what is to come. I was wondering how you go about tuning your hide heads. Do you tap tune to a certain pitch? I was also wondering how often you have to adjust them because of humidity. I see that you have a fire burning in some of your videos. Not this morning because it's warm this morning. Uh, I see you have a fire burning. I assume that kind of dry heat would really suck the moisture from the air. Well, that's right, Milwaukee. Um, uh, yeah, definitely I use hide heads on these two banjos. These are both just the cheapest goat, hide, goat hides you can get wherever you can find. You just need a cheap goat hide. I do not use the clear hides anymore. I went through a phase where I liked the transparent hides. I don't do that anymore. I like I get about the thickest goat hide I can find. You can also use deer hide. Deer and goat hide are basically the same. Um, <clears throat> and they are affected by humidity. You'll want to keep your banjos you know, not laying on the porch in the rain, <clears throat> not by an open window when it's raining and stuff like that. You'll also notice it's kind of a big bummer when you travel with these antique um, skin-hided banjos. They will change and loosen up on you whenever you get to where you are. So you need to bring a, some basic tools along with you usually to be able to tighten this up. So a little small crescent wrench is great to make minor adjustments or if you've got if you actually have the sockets you need most of my banjos I've got a couple different kinds of, of sockets on each one so I yeah anyhow you know how it goes you need to be able to, to adjust these whenever you travel that's important if you're gonna try to travel with this uh, for that reason I would get a plastic head honestly if I could neither this banjo or the or the other banjo this is my 1888 Luscombe. It has a, a non, not a standard size rim, so I have to use skin. And my Wayman also is not standard. The height, the crown height is um, way too high or something. I forget what. So anyhow, um, I'm going, rambling on too much about that. But so what do I do? Yeah, there's, you can take a tuner <coughs> up to your banjo and flick it. And if you've tuned your strings, if you're going to tune in standard G tuning, you should flick it and be able to get a, a G on this. That's the uh, that's how the bluegrassers would tune up. They tune their banjo to D, put the tuner on the on the head and flick it and tighten these lugs until it rings a G. We don't need to do that. Um, and these things, these skin heads, they're never going to stay where you put them. It's all guesswork. So it's up to you, really. I tighten these just to get the kind of tension that I know that I like, that I want. And they're a little bit softer than what somebody else might want. It's also raining here uh, quite a bit frequently lately, so my hides are a little bit looser than usual. So you guys might hear that it's a little bit muddied. It's a little bit muffled because it's been raining here a lot. And that's just the name of the game. Um, so you can tap tune if you want, if you have a plastic head especially. I don't do that. I just keep, I just tighten it up and to the, where I like it. About like that. And uh, you, there's some great players out there who play with a really soft or, you know, the old timers, really muffled, loose heads, whatever, doesn't matter. Um, one thing I'll say, I know a lot of you guys are from Europe and other, other countries. And if you've got an old antique American banjo or maybe even a modern American banjo, you might, um, you might not be able to use metric um, sockets to tighten these, the metric wrench. You might have to get the English um, socket set to tighten these up. So that's one thing to keep in mind too. Um, yeah. Um, okay, I think I answered that. It's basically you just play it by ear and be prepared to adjust them when you travel and stuff. And if you've got an American banjo, you might you might not you you might need a American old English measurement sockets on that one. And I got one more question. I think I'll get to before I let y'all go. 
Got a few minutes left. Here's, okay, another good question about antique banjos. <clears throat> Tim asks, um, any advice on acquiring a solid antique banjo? What to look for slash what to avoid and where to look? Well, yeah, there's a lot of good antique banjos out there. Um, they're mostly going to be, I don't know, they're all, they range in price. So, okay. What to look for? <laughs> you know, Luscom is a good brand. Wayman is good. Bacon, Lion and Healy. You, you, you can find the good brands pretty quick. Um, what to look for? Well, I can tell you what not to, like what to avoid. So around the turn of the century, the, like a lot of the, like the Sears and Roebuck catalog and stuff, they produced a ton of banjos between like 1890 and like probably like all through up until like World War II, you know, they would have, anyhow, so through that period, there's a ton of cheap, crummy banjos that are from like 1890, mostly like 1900 up to like 1940. There is some junk. Um, so if it's like a no name, you and you can find out what these look like. They usually they're made of cheaper wood. They have pieced peg heads, uh, maybe some paint, weird painted rims and stuff. They're cool and stuff. If they're great, but they're only worth like a hundred bucks or something. Don't go spending your eight hundred dollars on a, a Sears and Roebuck like no name banjo just because it's from like nineteen hundred. They made some junk back then. Also, the, the best banjos were made during that same period, from like 1880 to about like 1914, up until the beginning of the First World War. That's when the best banjos were made, I think. So that's why I have this uh, early 1890s Luscom that I play a lot, and my, my Wayman is 1900, 1910. That's the best period. Um, Things to avoid, well basically, like when you get an antique banjo, just, okay, one thing I always tell people, don't pay more than like seven to nine hundred dollars for a banjo. There's no banjo out there that's really worth more than eight hundred bucks. Like, unless, you know, it's covered in inlay and gold plating and stuff, okay. But as far as a good solid plain, you see my banjos are both all very plain. For a solid plain instrument, don't pay more than eight hundred dollars. And expect when you buy it that, you know, almost all of them have a warped neck. They need um, to have the neck planed, which is going to run you uh, $100, $200 to get that done. So just know when you get into antique instruments, you are going to probably have to do some repairs on them, have that done. Um, and that's just the name of the game, you know. Uh, we, we can talk about that more, but just keep that in mind. Try not, you know, don't pay like try to get it for under a thousand bucks and especially like if if you know the neck is warped and stuff like that well you know you're gonna have to spend another 200 bucks just to get that fixed there's a lot of things to think about I might have to we'll have to keep going on this subject I'm out of time here guys I try to keep it to about eight minutes a video so I'm gonna end it there and uh, Tim I hope that was a reasonable answer we'll keep talking about it if you want and uh, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you later.